Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Werb, and I'm the director of the Library of Congress's Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement, um, which does programming here at the library. Um, we're happy to have you all here today for our annual Jonah Sokoff Eskin Memorial Program. The Eskin family is here on behalf of the library. I'd like to thank them for their continued support of our children's and young adult programs at the library. Thank you. I also want to welcome the three schools that are here with us today. DC International School. <laughs> Elliot Hine Middle School. And Capitol Hill Day School. Welcome all of you. I know you are get a chance to meet each other because you're going to be sharing tables while you do this activity. And you're all in for a great event today. The library is honored to host Charles Wat Waters and Tracy Sorrell. Charles Waters is a children's poet, actor, educator, and co-author of African Town, Dictionary for a Better World, Poems, Quotes, and Anecdotes from A to Z, and the award-winning Can I Touch Your Hair, Poems of Race, Mistakes, and Friendship. He lives near Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome. Thank you. Cherokee Nation citizen Tracy Sorrell writes inclusive, award-winning fiction and nonfiction in a variety of formats for young people. She is a two-time Cybert Medal and Orbis Pictus honoree for her nonfiction work. Her first five books have received awards from the American Indian Library Association. Welcome. Welcome to both of you. We're thrilled to have you. and. I, I will leave the stage and just welcome you for a conversation. Thank you. CEO, Tracy Sorrell, Dagwado, Tijalagi, Gieji, Ani, Gilohi. I'm Tracy Sorrell, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, I'm a mom of a 14 year old who's an eighth grader. And it is delightful. One of the things that I enjoy most about my job is getting to spend time with young people. So this is a delight to have you all here. I look forward to the conversation and I want to say a special, special thank you to the Jonah Solkoff Eskin family for being here and um, inviting us to share with you all today in Jonah's memory and, um, to, you know, to talk about a lot of issues that, you know, are presented, you know, in this book, but really we're going to look at issues kind of in general, uh, you know, what do you experience in your world? And so, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charles to introduce himself. Yes. Hello, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at the Library of Congress. Uh, when I was first started off writing, uh, I kind of looked at this place like somebody would look at Oz. And to, to be here decades later and speaking with you is, is a true honor. I'm, I'm deeply touched. And, um, and the, the, uh, the Sokoff... Uh, Esk, uh, the Jonah Eskin, Jonah Sokoff Eskin Memorial Program. Got that all out. Um, I found out a, a lot about it a couple weeks ago. I am humbled to my core to be here uh, in honor of Jonah and, and his life of, of kindness and, and decency and, and strength, which I think uh, myself and Tracy's book uh, encapsulates those, those tenets. So... Um, Yes. Need for more of it, and in the need for more of it, especially in these uh, turbulent times that we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. So, with that, I do want to say a special thank you to everyone at the Library of Congress for not only inviting us but providing an early tour, having people here. You know, one of the docents here early to give us a tour. It's just a magnificent building, and I know you all are nearby, so you know it's like something you take for granted. But truly. I mean, out of all the buildings that I've been in D.C. and I interned here previously and worked here, it's just a work of art. So I do hope that if you haven't had a chance to go and look around, please do so. Um, and the staff could not be more classy. Yeah. It's a wo exactly. wonderful organization. Exactly. All right. Um, oh, I did not turn it on. Thank you. See, I already forgot my instructions. All right, so we're going to visit about Mascot. Um, 
which is a novel in verse and features six eighth graders not too far from here. We created a fictional city, uh, Rye, Virginia, so in Fairfax County, I think kind of around Falls Church area. And um, they are looking at the mascot issue in their school district. The high school students have already been galvanized around the issue, but it hasn't really impacted, or middle school students haven't really weighed in on that. And so um, that's the, the format, is those six characters telling the story uh, through poems, through their experiences. And we're going to start off by kind of giving you the inciting incident, like where the action really gets going in the very beginning. So we'll start with um, Pep Rally. Callie. Tigers, my school's mascot back home. Fierce, nobody harassed, strong, no offensive signs or chants. Here, it's a whole other world. Lunchtime, the high school pep squad comes over and sets up a table for face painting. Seriously? The whooping from guys after they get lines painted across their face is bad enough. But then the cafeteria breaks out in a tomahawk chop chant. Save it for the pep rally, yells one of the lunch staff. Instead of our last class that afternoon, we head to the high school gym a block away. By the time I set foot inside, I know what's coming, and my land back t-shirt won't help. Clammy palms rest on my jeans, my mouth dry as the desert, heat rising on my neck. The music pulsates, my classmates sing. I spring off the bleachers, pass the mascot head on the wall, and make it to the restroom just in time to heave up all the hate, disrespect, fear, and disgust. D disgust. Nope, I'm not a tiger anymore. Franklin. There's a face painting station at lunch, so I get in line to get my face covered in yellow and red stripes. Man, everyone is hyped up. There's so much smiling. I bet people haven't showed this much of their teeth since they last went to the dentist. The gym is filled with streamers and balloons, and cheerleaders are dancing to clear eyes, full heart, can't lose, by T. Powell. Then they jump, twirl, Flip around as the band starts playing our fight song. We are the mighty, mighty Braves. We battle from morning to night. Strength, pride, determination, all across our blessed nation. In a dark world, we shine as beacons of light. Ride, Braves, fight, fight, fight. Tonight's game can't come soon enough. Luis. Honestly, and I've said this forever, all this celebrating should be for football. Pero I ride this wave of excitement todo el día, porque soy un rai brave. And that's how we do. ¿Verdad? How could anyone not enjoy this? Que chivo. Priya. Racism. This pep rally, filled with chants and gestures that sow no honor for Native people, is just racism. Tessa. This is such a bummer. I've heard about it for years. Seeing it though, wow. My mouth hangs open for so long, some people mistake it for something positive. They lean in and say, super cool, right? Bet you didn't get this kind of school spirit at home. If only they could read the thoughts in my head. This needs to stop now. Sean, I thought about getting my face painted today, but I'm a bit too shy for all that. Maybe next time. I wore my Rye Brave shirt instead. The logo is so big, it takes up most of the front. I feel that's enough school spirit for me, at least until tonight. Hope the high school finally wins district this year. Go Braves! Um, and so the book was really born out of um, Charles contacting me. And so I'll let him chat a little bit about uh, where the idea came from with the book. 
So I was in college uh, back in the 90s. And <laughs> I can't believe it's been it's coming 30 years. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so I was in college in the 90s. I'm a big bas- I was a big basketball fan back then, and St. John's was one of the big teams. And I noticed they changed their name. It was in the papers. They were going to change their name from the St. John's Redman to the Red Storm. And I'm like, well, why did they change the logo? I like the logo. I thought the logo was fine. And then the, the more I read articles about it, I read how the mascot was uh, a racist mascot against Native people, which fascinated me because I didn't, I didn't see what the problem was. But if they changed it, it must mean something. It must mean that it, it is, because why would you just change a logo like that? So that's really, honestly, got me started thinking about the mascot issue and, and ideas everybody take a long time to develop. And I thought about it for years and didn't feel it was, it was just my story to, to write about something like this. And then Tracy and I met at something called the Highlights Foundation, everyone. Highlights Magazine. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Highlights Magazine. Okay, well, the great grand, the grandson of the founders of Highlights Magazine named Kent Brown created a foundation for upcoming writers and illustrators, and it's on their family property in Pocono Mountains in the home of the Lenape Nation. And Tracy and I took a novel and verse workshop in 2017 in June in June 2017, and a novel in verse is what mascot is, everybody. That's, that's um, it's, it's poems in novel form that tell a story. And so Tracy and I took a verse novel workshop together and became pals among all the people in the group. We, we became pals. And a couple years later, I was, I was um, working on this with somebody else and it didn't feel it didn't feel right and so I thought you know I think Tracy would be the one to tell the story with me so I maybe emailed and text her and got a response in like 10 minutes like I'm in and so that's how it started well what I really said to him was Charles do you know what you're getting into because um, I, after I went, I'm the first person in my family to go to college and um, I had planned to be a professor. And so I had gone to graduate school and then I'd gone to law school and I was at the University of North Dakota teaching in the law school and also working with tribal courts across the nation who were either implementing or enhancing tribal court systems, which is like helping tribal court personnel get trained, helping to draft legal codes, et cetera. But they have a mascot at that time called the Fighting Sioux. And I've never been on a campus that had a Native mascot before. And I had not been in the middle of that kind of a controversy. And so, you know, I am mixed Cherokee and various European backgrounds, right? So I'm white passing in my daily life. There are five nations in North Dakota. And um, much like people in Cherokee Nation who look from white to black, um, that's our citizenry in terms of how we look. In North Dakota, you have a variety of people, but definitely um, th- there is an identi- you know, identifying um, kind of phenotype of, of folks that, that live up there. And so on campus, those students are being targeted, faculty and staff from Native nations, as well as those who are allies, are being targeted. And it's this very hostile environment because, and I'm thinking, this is a college town, like how is this happening in a place of higher learning, right? So I had no um, bear, you know, idea about K-12 when we started this book. I knew it from the university level. But at the time when he writes to me, my family's living in Kansas City. And so we do have the Kansas City Chiefs. So again, on the pro team side, I'm very aware. And I also have a young child at this point. And that's actually my son's words here. How do you honor when you tell lies, lie about us being red and saying we're all dead? This is not who we are, not the, not, nor this, nor that. We are not savages. And so he's, you know, taken the imagery from, of course, Atlanta Braves, then the um, Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Blackhawks. And so a young child is very much seeing, like, 
this is not like who um, Native people, whether it's Cherokee Nation or the other larger Native community that lives there in the Kansas City area, because over two-thirds of Native people live in cities. So we're everywhere. There's a large Native population in Cleveland where you had the Cleveland Indians. They had been moved there by the federal government in the 50s and 60s. And so I said, you know, we're, we're going to be putting our foot in this, writing about this, because there's a lot. Well, then we do the research on what the experiences of students in the K-12 system, whether they're native or non-native, and that really spurred us to go, okay, we, we need to do this book. Um, and kind of at the heart of the issue around mascots, and there's always some kind of issue, right, around any issue um, that one group is, is saying, you know, hey, here's the problem, and the other group's like, why is this truly an issue? With mascots, that core issue is cultural appropriation, which sounds like a big fancy word, but literally what it means is one group is adopting parts of the, uh, another group's um, identity, whether that could be images that they use, symbols, sounds, you know, music, um, instrumentation, whatever, and they're using them in ways that that group never intended that do not show any respect to them. So for example, let's say with native themed mascots, right? That could be creating a war whoop um, or a tomahawk chop chant, right? Which you do not hear native people doing. Um, that, that does not happen. Beating a drum and acting out a ceremony, right? Or dancing gibberish. So like, let's say you're at um, a Kansas City Chiefs game or Atlanta Braves. This happens also with K-12. Someone's beating the drum. Now, if you were around the drum and you're with people from a native nation, no one is drinking alcohol. No one is using any kind of substance, right, that would alter your body around that drum. It's you're in ceremony. That drum is not taken out, and only certain people can sit around that drum. Those that are drum keepers, those that have been through um, training on how to do that, you know, I, you don't just sit down at the drum. And um, similarly, use of eagle feathers, creating headdresses, you have to go through a lot of preparation for that. Other people have deemed you worthy of receiving that. People have prayed over that. People have worked to prepare that, gather those eagle feathers in a respectful way. And it's not something that you can buy a cheap knockoff and dance at Coachella or show up at a sporting event. And so that's what we mean by cultural appropriation. And that happens with other groups too, right? It's not just Native people. In the context of this story, that's what we're talking about. But um, Native Americans, as um, Crystal Echohawk, Echo Hawk, who's from the Pawnee Nation, talks about it, were the only group being used as sports mascots depicting Native American communities not as people, but as other. No other group in the United States has sanctioned mocking of who they are, from the peewee level to the professional level. And um, I think a lot of that stems from the fact that we don't understand or see, and we meaning kind of the larger collective United States, see Native nations as sovereign right? We're often viewed as culture clubs. We're just another cultural group um, that has, you know, wonderful contributions, right? We've got language, we've got art, we've got um, various things that we've contributed, but we're, we're culture clubs. And that's not, I mean, certainly we do have rich cultures, but that is not at the essence of who we are. Prior to any European setting foot in the Caribbean, on this continent, wherever they came, Native nations were controlling land, people, right? They, they had their own governments, and that continues to today. So as a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, I am subject to tribal laws, Cherokee Nation laws, civil and criminal. Also, because of that separate status, and when the Europeans came, like you see here, so Native nations are first on this continent, right? They've been here for tens of thousands of years. Then Europeans come over, set up colonies, that represent various countries, right? And they're claiming different lands, resources, et cetera, for their own. Later on, the United States is formed, making some of those colonies into states, and then territories become states, et cetera. 
By and large, Native people do not become citizens of the United States until 1924. So that hasn't even been 100 years ago. And I say that to say that, like I say, first, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Second, I'm a citizen of the United States. That is a very recent country. It may or may not stick around. It may go away. I don't know. I know that the Cherokee Nation, though, is always going to be here, right? That, that is here. And so because there's not that understanding of the government-to-government -government relationship, whether it was with Europeans who signed treaties with tribes first or later the United States, oftentimes there's this sense of, well, they existed in the past. They're not still here today. But they are. I just came from New Orleans where the National Congress of American Indians is meeting. And this is tribal leaders from across the country who are coming together to work on advocacy and policy issues. Lots of youth your same ages were also there on a youth track, and I talked to them about this book. And they were getting all kinds of, of other workshops and things that they were doing. But we're, we're very much in your neighborhoods, in your classrooms. There's a ton of Native people who live in Washington, D.C. because of that government-to-government -government relationship that are working you know, in the halls of Congress, in the White House, in law firms, in policy firms, at the Smithsonian, et cetera. But it's tradition. Right. Well, who's exactly? I'd just like to re read, this, read this slide real quick for you. What relationship does the educational institution, the town slash city, or sports organization currently have with those depicted as the mascot? Have the symbols, songs, clothing, and other items depicted, including the mascot's name, been chosen after lengthy collaboration with the known leaders and wisdom keepers from Native nations? If not, why not? Examine what keeps that from happening now. So that's really the crux of it, right? Is that oftentimes people will say, but we've always had this mascot. You know, this has been our, our school's mascot or our team's mascot for 50 years, 100 years, whatever it's been. So, you know, this means a lot to us. But whose image is it doing? Did you consult with them? Did they, they say how that image is being represented? When you, who aren't even at a school that has a native mascot, plays another school that does, and you go to district or state or wherever to play, oftentimes there are people who are objectifying that in terms of the signage that you'll see, you know, your butcher paper. There's all kinds of racist things that come out in those environments. There's all kinds of chants, you know, and, and certainly, again, that happens at the college and, and the pro level as well. So when we say tradition, whose? Whose is being centered and whose is being left out? And, and that's really what um, is at the heart of this, is like have people been consulted? Have you looked at the wisdom keepers? And that's true for many issues, right? Who is not being consulted? When we think about, um, you know, the Flint, uh, Michigan water crisis, right? Who is being impacted by not having clean water? A lot of low income, a lot of um, BIPOC communities, right? And why aren't they being consulted? Why aren't their needs being centered? So it, it really goes across lots of different um, areas. And um, do you want to talk about the, it's a nationwide issue? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as you can see here, uh, overall, uh, schools with native theme mascots, what the current numbers are as of April 5th of this year. And just look at, I mean, just look at those numbers. These, these are the kind of things, everybody, when you're creating a book, you gather research. You know, there's an actor named Willem Dafoe, he calls it earning your make-believe. Mm -hmm. So for, you, for, the, for the book to be taken seriously by the readers, you have to put in the work. Right. Cannot stress that enough. Yeah. So these are the things that Tracy and I would email each other about. And I mean, look at those statistics overall. 1, 1,901 total schools and 966 total school districts. So this is and, and that's not just, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, that's just folks that live in rural areas. That's, that we, we don't have that problem here. But that's not true. Cities, suburbs, rural areas, 
this is across the United States. And um, in the back of the book is a link to the NCAI, the National Congress of American Indians website, where they track the schools. And one of the things that Charles and I um, found out recently is that the state of New York has banned all mascots in K-12 schools as of July 1st this next year. So any school that wants to maintain using a native mascot has to have permission from native nations within the state of New York to do so. So we'll see how that um, comes about. But you know there are places where, where young people are, are taking action on this. But oftentimes, your voices are the ones that are missing on this issue and, and other issues. And what do you want your school environment to be like? So certainly in the book, these young people are having that discussion, right? Well, what do we want our school to be like? What do we want it to be like in our school district? Um, like I say, the, the high school students have weighed in, but not the middle school. And um, what, do you, what do you think about traditions? So those are just kind of things that we, we bring up in the book, but we're not looking to do anything more than really you know, get that conversation going. Um, in crafting the characters, we set it outside of Washington, D.C., as I said. We mentioned over in Falls Church, and that's um, in large part because, you know, that is an area where there's a lot of diversity of people. Native people live over there as well as, um, you know, we've got Priya. Um, just in crafting the characters, Callie's a black Cherokee Nation citizen, and she's new to town in the school. And so kind of her arrival is what sets, at least for her honors English class, her teacher um, thinking about, well, we've got this um, persuasive assignment coming up, right, where you're going to do an oral presentation and a writing. So, you know, let's look at this issue since it's already going on within the district. You want to talk about Franklin? Franklin loves football, wearing fresh kicks, and so far has resisted his parents' desire for him to learn more about his black heritage. Mm -hmm. You have... Sh you uh, Tracy talked about Priya, mm -hmm. who wants to be a journalist and has four grandparents all born in India. You have Sean, who's a sixth generation Rye student in an Irish family that often needs help from the food pantry. Tessa, who is white, was previously homeschooled and has grandparents who marched with Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And Luis, who immigrated from El Salvador at seven and aspires to be a math teacher and coach. One of the things Tracy and I talked about Mm -hmm. uh, besides talking about the mascot issues, we were both fascinated by class issues, mm -hmm. and 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 sometimes uh, in society, people think class issues would be where uh, uh, black black folk are economically disadvantaged uh, and white people are not. When in fact, uh, it, it's a a lot different than that. It's a lot more complicated. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated. There's a yeah. word Trace and I use a lot mm -hmm. that we believe in a lot in life, and that's nuance. Yeah. And that's something we wanted to bring to this book. Yeah. And so it, there's there's more layers. I mean, a lot of people will say, well, it's this or it's that. It's never this or it's that. There's always um, a variety of perspectives, a variety of backgrounds, and ways that um, you know people need to be more informed about what's going on to be able to, to have a conversation. I'm so proud of all of you and, and what you've come up with. I've heard some of, some of your ideas. I've heard some of your poems. Um, you all are great kids. Just want you all to know from Trace and I, you matter. Your thoughts matter. We value you. We wish you the best in your journey forward. And we hope you take something from this book and and we hope you find something passionate. We've had a long road to get to publishing. It has been it took many years and years of rejections for many years, and we still get rejected. But we just hung in there, and we hope that whatever you're passionate about in your lives, you hang in there as well when, when you get some resistance and you keep forging ahead. And, and we thank you very much for being here.